Hello, and welcome to episode 91 of the Ask Historians podcast. I'm very excited today to have, uh, we're going to talk to Matthew Nichols, who is previously did an AMA for us. He's a university uh, professor over at the University of Reading. We're going to be talking about his virtual Rome project. So we're going to get right into that. Um, and then at the end of this episode, I'm going to have a little bit of a special announcement. So uh, tune in for that afterwards, okay? And on to the episode. <laughs> Welcome to the Ask Historians podcast. Hello, and welcome to another episode of the Ask Historians podcast. I'm here with Dr. Matthew Nichols. He is an associate professor in the Department of Classics at the University of Reading, uh, as well as the director of their master's research into the City of Rome uh, program there as well, uh, which <laughs> we'll, I assume we'll be utilizing the virtual model uh, down to the street level of the City of Rome, ancient City of Rome, that we will be discussing here today. But before we do that, Dr. Nichols, could you give us an idea about what got you into and interested in studying Rome and Roman history? I've been in Rome and the ancient Romans for a long time. I had very good teachers at school and at university who fostered that interest and maintained it and allowed me to bend it in directions that matched other things I was interested in as well, like buildings and places. I'm trying to get a sense of how ancient institutions and, and buildings and monuments actually functioned. Uh, so through my undergraduate studies, my training was in Latin and Greek and history, and I carried that on into my PhD where I worked in ancient libraries. But during that PhD in particular, I was wanting to think about how these library buildings functioned and what kind of neighborhoods they stood in and what they looked like. And that brought me back towards an interest in architecture and architectural drawing and digital modeling that had always been there in the background anyway, I think. So um, my academic studies met up with this other interest in a very fruitful way at that point, and I took things forward from there. Well, to focus specifically on on our topic of conversation today, which is the the virtual Rome model that you built, mm -hmm. uh, Rome is a city that uh, I guess you could kind of politely say has been mapped in a in a great number of ways in a great number of times. I mean, what kind of distinctifies uh, the model that you've built then? Well, for a start, making it in 3D means that you can do things with it that you can't in all those centuries and centuries of mapping and description and drawing and other media, wonderful as those are. So this is a new tool that we can bring into that tool set that people have been experimenting with for centuries now. Before the discipline of classics or archaeology really existed, people have been describing and drawing ruins and then turning those into conjectural reconstructed illustrations of what the buildings might have been like when new, and they've done that in in drawing and in painting and physical models. And those are all terrific media, but they have their, their limitations. And with a digital model, the extra thing you can do is fly around it, zoom into it, change the point of view that you're looking from, take slices through a building, change the lighting conditions. So it's a more dynamic medium, I think, and one that gives us the ability to fly into a building, stand inside it, walk around it. And I think that that's the particular advantage of using these tools to approach these spaces. Now, you've obviously been drawing upon historical records and historical maps and even, I would guess, in, uh, historical models of the city mm -hmm. itself. But I mean, is there, have you found yourself kind of having to need to incorporate um, newer research and newer findings, even newer archaeological methods into kind of filling in the gaps in the city? Yes, I have. It, it's inherently a very multidisciplinary project, or at least multi-source kind of a project. So I've been reading whatever I can of what ancient authors say. I've been looking at pictures on coins, uh, inscriptions from the buildings that give us information about them. Of course, archaeological material and standing ruins, historical drawings and depictions of the buildings. As you say, historical models, like there's a, a wonderful physical model in a museum in, in Rome that you can go and look at. So there are all sorts of different sources of evidence and different kinds of interpretations that have already been accumulated that I've been looking at. And as for new information, yes, it comes up all the time, actually. People are conducting excavations all over Rome. At the moment, there's a big dig that's happening to put a new metro line, a third metro line, into the city of Rome. And they're finding all sorts of interesting things, some of which I've been able to put into the model to reflect uh, a new understanding about the city. There's a, a marble map of Rome that we might talk about later, an ancient marble map. And occasionally, people identify a new fragment of that. And when they do that, I can try and incorporate that into the model. And that's another nice advantage of a digital medium, is that you can replace things you know i used to say you can easily replace things that's sadly not true it's always a lot of work but you can at least go in take out an old interpretation make a new one and slot it in in a way that you couldn't do with say a watercolor or an architectural drawing or not as easily 
Now, of course, even with all these sources to draw upon and even the new research, there must be uh, gaps in the city or even, uh, you know, parts of the city where one source might disagree with how a part of the city looked or uh, how that part of the city was used. Uh, it, is there a particular kind of uh, protocol that you use to kind of interpret uh, how a, I guess, a, a less well-sourced of a city uh, might look? Yes, that's a very good question, and there are several sorts of answers to it. Another ambiguity or conflict within the model that we might add to that list is that things look different at different periods, so we have to try and pick a date. And I've done that, but the date which I picked is, is a bit of a, a convenient, um, a polite fiction, because actually all my buildings look more or less simultaneously new. And I've done that for quite good reasons, which is I want to make reconstructions of them as first built, mostly. Uh, but having them all coexisting simultaneously creates a sort of artificial newness of look that isn't quite right historically. So we might come on to the question of date, but there's another uh, difficult factor one has to wrestle with. There are lots and lots of gaps in the city, and if there weren't, we wouldn't have to make a reconstruction of it in a way. So any reconstructive act will partly be imaginative and speculative. So I've used what evidence I can, um, and I'm sure there are things I've missed, but I've tried to be as completist as I can about looking at everything for the buildings that I've made. But that still leaves an awful lot of the city where we just know very little, or buildings where we have differential levels of knowledge. Um, what I've done, for example, with the, the infill of the cities, I think, all those miles and miles of residential and commercial streets for which very little direct evidence survives, is to use what evidence we have as the basis for extrapolating what I think those neighbourhoods might have looked like. So fragments of this marble map that we have give us little pockets of the city, little windows in, and I can locate those, draw in those streets and buildings, and then extend the streets outwards till they meet each other and try and fill in what I think would be the right kind of building mix. And we can look at other sites like Pompeii or Herculaneum or Ostia with all the cautions that attend using comparable sites for such a unique city as Rome. And we can look at other places and periods, in fact, to try and understand how pre-modern, pre-industrial cities function and what kind of building materials and building mixes we might see. So there's a, a lot of different ways of drawing together what evidence we have and then filling in the gaps in that evidence. Um, but it will never be perfect and other interpretations are very possible. And what I'd like to think about building it in the future is some way of showing variational doubt within the model. That's quite a big thing at the moment in scholars who are working on reconstruction, because quite often what the immediate audience wants or thinks it wants is something vivid and colourful and realistic, is the word people use, it, compelling, visually complete. But actually, that can mask over differential levels of certainty or different kinds of evidence. And some visual way of showing it, turning on a layer that made buildings we know most about appear in colour and maybe the conjectural ones in black and white or partly transparent or something like that, I think it would be a worthwhile experiment to try and show where the gaps are in an honest way rather than pretending we know an equal amount about every structure. Now, you, you had teased the time period a little bit uh, without actually saying when it, when it was, but you're, you're modeling the city uh, somewhat late in, in what we would call, kind of, I guess, the, the Western Imperial period, you know, towards kind of towards the end of the, the Western yeah. Empire. Yeah, that's right. So the age of Constantine. And the reason for that, and it's an age that other people have picked too, is that there are certain buildings that stand in Rome now that you really want to put in your model because they are there in, in current Rome and anything that's going to appeal to people who've been to Rome ought to contain, for example, the Arch of Constantine, the Basilica of Maxentius and Constantine, um, the honorific columns and the Forum. It's standing remains that are pretty late and that um, people will want to see. But you also, if you're making classical Rome, you want to do it before the Goths come in and cut the aqueducts and everything starts falling to bits. So it's a good era to pick for the most complete instantiation of, of classical Rome. But you're right, it's pretty late on in the imperial period. Uh, so my model is nominally early 4th century, period of Constantine, but before really the great wave of church building starts and classical monuments start getting spoliated for their columns and marbles to be used in, in uh, basilicas and churches. So it's a good moment to have picked. But as I said, I cheated by making everything looking simultaneously more or less new and fresh, which is ahistorical. So in the future, it'd be lovely to make a whole sequence of Romes and work out a way of aging buildings and showing decrepitude and decay. And there are a few instances in my model where I do show buildings in decay where I have to, where a later structure cuts across and effaces or partly demolishes an earlier one. I have to show that, so I do. And there's a few buildings I could you name where you see a city wall or something cutting across the line of an earlier building. But where I don't have to, I've tended to show each building as, as new or more or less new. 
So, are, I mean, are there plans? It sounds like there are already plans in, in the works to kind of take better known areas of the city and kind of perhaps even show like kind of a time lapse of how this, this area or this particular building might have changed over time. Yeah, I would say, you know, warm intentions rather than plans <laughs> because our plans are quite specific. And it's taken me about 10 years to make this model. I would dearly love to make five or six of them, but that uh, implies a, a good deal of faith in my own longevity to, to, to kind of work on that time scale. So it would be great to do that, um, finding the means to do it and the kind of the right framework within which maybe some kind of collaborative project so that we could all make different eras of different bits of the city at different periods. What would be really lovely is a time slider. So you drag the, the slider and buildings pop up and decay and disappear and new ones take their place. And that would just be terrific. And that idea of modeling through time rather than taking a single synchronic snapshot, making a truly diachronic model, is something that is another stage again of potential with with digital reconstruction is what I think of as four-dimensional modeling rather than just three-dimensional modeling. And I'm not aware of much of that being done yet. Some some is. There's a really good project in Germany that's making the Roman Forum through the ages, for example. But a city-scale model of Rome that represented, and it's been ambitious, everything from the 9th century BC to the present day would be would be a wonderful project, but a bit beyond the scope of any one individual, I think. Well, I mean, you could always say that Rome wasn't modeled in a day. I often make that very remark when I'm giving talks <laughs> on this, yes. Uh, and it's a lovely project to do solo. I mean, I've had huge fun doing it, and it, it's been great to make something that's pretty much all my own work. But it would be nice also to collaborate with other teams or experts or however it was done to create something even bigger in scope. Well, to, to move away from the kind of grandiose monumental architecture of Rome, you know, modeling a city on a on, literally on a street level at a kind of a 3D, you know, you can step into a three street level. I mean, that's a fairly intimate approach to the city. Have you found yourself kind of learning uh, something about the people who actually lived in Rome at this time through this work? Yes, I think I have. I mean, I've learned a lot about the layout and topography of Rome and its geography and its natural landscape and about the principles of Roman architecture, all of which I arrogantly thought I knew quite a bit about when I started, but actually I didn't. You know, sitting down and drawing everything in the city from scratch um, is a really good way of, of realizing how many gaps there are in your knowledge. So I've, I've had fun and learned about the city doing that and about life in the city. Yes, I think so. I mean, you read all these ancient poets, for example, you know, Marshall, Juvenal, who talk about life in the city and its busy winding streets and how chaotic and squalid and noisy it is. And my model is kind of eerily calm and empty because there are no people in it. But what you do get is this sense of, of winding, mazy streets that are very different in flavor to the grand monuments. And I think as scholars of the ancient city, we're used to thinking of it in map form and plan form, even when we don't realize we're doing so. We have this neat 2D overhead, north at the top kind of image of Rome and its layout. And no Roman ever really saw it like that. I mean, they had maps. They could they could read and understand maps. But at ground level, they didn't see how this great imperial forum relates to the one next door because there's an enormous high wall in between them. And the same with great monuments that we think of as the hallmarks or the focal points. Actually, you can't see those from most of the city. And sometimes they pop up at the end of the street and then vanish again as you turn a corner. And um, walking around at street level within the model I get lost a lot, which I found very inst instructive. I should know where everything is. I know the city pretty well. I, I built this model. But I keep having to look at what, you know, where is the sun, or is that aqueduct poking up above the rooftop? Is it this one or that one? Or well, if it's that one, if I turn right here, I might see the Colosseum. And that sort of experiential wandering about the city and seeing it from ground level, it's really, really different to seeing it in plan view. And I found that difference, which I ought to have been able to conjecture or, or to, to guess at, Nonetheless, actually seeing it in real time, it is quite striking. As you're kind of walking around in, in this area, even without people, do you do you find that certain neighborhoods have, a, I guess, a certain character to them where you could say, uh, you know, aha, this is this is where they must have been doing a lot of buying and selling. Uh, aha, this is clearly, you know, a place where, you know, several roads converge near, you know, uh, you know, kind of a neighborhood temple of some sort. Yeah, there's, there's a bit of that. I mean, there's a risk of circular reasoning in that I, I built things in a certain way because I thought, you know, this is a place where lots of roads converge. Let's put an open piazza in it, that kind of reasoning. But it is true. And you get a different flavor of the flatlands and the valley bottoms and the hilltops. And you can see why the hilltops were prized for you know, the, the, the big garden estates and the, the big villas when they could get some land up there. Because getting the view and having a sense of location within the city is always a nice break from wandering around miles and miles of, of, of small winding streets in the valley bottoms or plus areas like campus marshes. 
uh, and you, you start to see why big areas of open ground uh, are, are good places to build monuments. I mean, again, one could conjecture this, but actually being in these spaces and seeing how groups of monuments can kind of articulate themselves within a wherever they have space to do so, the elbow room to do so. Um, so yeah, obviously the campus marshes or the area around the Colosseum that turns into a sort of entertainment hub where buildings on the hills talk to the buildings in the valley bottoms and vice versa. Um, it, it's interesting to see how these neighbourhoods do develop. Uh, and the area around Tiber Island, of course, is very well connected with the bridges um, and, and the road network and the river network there. So you you get to understand why the Aventine Dockyard area and the Thornville Orium are so important in the supply and trade of Rome. Um, those are interesting areas to wander around in the model too. So I know in a recent uh, Ask Historians kind of Ask Me Anything session, you had mentioned that the, the baths of Caracalla were kind of, you had a bit of a love-hate relationship with them and how difficult they were to model, but also how much fun they were to model, I guess you could yeah. say. Uh, so, I mean, have you found yourself kind of finding other parts of the city that uh, perhaps are challenging you in, in different ways, not just in their complexity, but also in just kind of trying to figure out what was going on in the city at the time? Yeah, there are lots of different areas that have that level of challenge or different sorts of challenge. So the bars of Caracalla are interesting. I set myself a series of architectural challenges there to make complicated roofs that curve in two different planes and have recessed coffering in them and to make something that had you know, as much of the um, uh, internal uh, structures as well as the external ones as I could and really to go in a very high level of detail there. So that was a fun technical challenge in digital modelling terms. Other bits of the city trying to work out from sparse and sometimes conflicting evidence where certain buildings were, where the best arrangement is, because there are still quite large chunks of the, the city where you'll see quite divergent opinions among scholars. And when you're making a model like this, in the end, you have to pick one and, and you know, plump for it and hope you pick the right one. So getting quite deep into some of those um, questions, realizing how existing maps are quite hard to reconcile with each other sometimes. Um, what the... the the areas in transmission can be from a you know, print map um, into a digital uh, entity. All of those different sorts of challenges have been interesting to, I wouldn't say I've solved them, but interesting to address or to, to grapple with in their different ways. And then making anything at a city-wide scale and then making usable pictures from it, which is the end stage of the operation. I want to make a still picture or a movie or something, this online course that we've made, a fly-through. They're then a series of questions that are almost artistic, like how do I light it? What time of day do I want it to be? What focal depth do I want to use on the, on the lens? What kind of pathway do I want to animate over the city? Do we want to get all dramatic and kind of fly through doorways and down streets? Or do we want a stately aerial shot? And all of those questions, which are sort of almost cinematographic, um, are quite fun to to work out how best to show what you want to show and where the line is between just presenting information and something that we might think of as artistry or something with a bit of drama in it and, and where it's responsible to do one or the other. I quite enjoyed that. No, you, your mention of kind of the complexity of the of modeling the Bass of Caracalla, uh, I mean, uh, brought a question to my mind, which is, I mean, do you have to engage a lot with the the published material on, say, the Roman material sciences or Roman, you know, architectural styles at the time? I mean, do you find yourself saying, oh, wait, hold on, there, there's no way we could model it like this, this, you know, this style wasn't invented for another, you know, 50, 60 years or something like that? Yeah, so with the Baths of Caracalla, I mean, for a start, they, they survive in standing ruins pretty well. So I went there a lot and photographed it a lot. And no matter how many photographs I took, there's always one I was missing when I got home. And the particular angle of how this vault corresponds with that, that pier, this sort of thing. Um, so that was, uh, I was quite spoiled with the standing ruins. And then it's also been excellently published um, by Janet Delane, who, who gives us lots of ground plans and cross-sections and lots of information about exactly those kinds of technical and material questions that you were asking about. So generally speaking, um, for the, the bigger monuments and the better known buildings, there are sources that one can turn to. And I try to find those and to take them into account wherever I can. But there's a lot of areas of the city where the picture is less clear cut or less well defined. And no doubt I've overlooked many things in making those areas. But I've tried to read around widely to, to find out what current thinking is on. Or, I mean, often there's more than one source of current thinking, but what a representative sample might be on, on each area or building that I'm working on. 
Now, I just have one more question about the model, and then I want to talk about the actual online um, mm. class that you're proposing here. Uh, and, and that's more about kind of expansion of the model or kind of making modules to the module. Um, mm-hmm. I, I know in the AMA, you had mentioned uh, how much you'd love to see something done comparatively to model something like the, the Villa of Hadrian. Um, yeah. are, are there plans to kind of take this approach? And even if it's not you doing it, perhaps uh, you consult or you help with other uh, parts of Rome, you know, parts of the Appian Way, Port of Ostia, something like that. Yeah, that that would be great. And in a in a small way, I've been doing that here with my students who make models of their own particular bits of the ancient world for their assessed work here at Reading. And I know of other projects doing similar things. So something I've been doing for the last couple of years is is talking to people who are making other periods, places, civilizations. Um, I know I had a a colloquium here at Reading a couple of weeks ago, and we we heard from people making medieval castles and a city in Egypt and other cities in the Roman world and uh, an 18th century garden on the Thames in London. There are just wonderful projects out there, people um, using these techniques for their own particular illustrative projects, and and some of them academics, some of them in the heritage sector, some in the computer games industry. There are lots and lots of projects going on. So I think there's scope for us all to talk to each other um, and discuss method and more abstractly our goals and our, our working methodologies to try and see best practice elsewhere and, and what we can learn from each other. As for my own work, uh, I want to stick with Rome for a little bit. As I said, my real dream would be to make lots and lots of different Romes from different periods. But I have made other places. I um, made uh, bits of Rome in Scotland for a BBC documentary. Uh, I've made some Near Eastern architecture. I'm working on our local Roman town of Silchester with my students. So it's always fun to go and make different places. And I have rather enjoyed making different styles and periods of architecture. But there I start to stray away from my own area of particular disciplinary expertise. But it's been quite refreshing to try and set new technical challenges in the software and work in new, new styles of drawing. And it sounds like you've gotten a lot of interest from people in uh, the video game industry as well. Yes, we're making a computer game out of my Rome model. So there's a studio called Breakout who are making a, a massive multiplayer online role-playing game, and they're using my model as the basis for it, or as the setting for it, which would be called Life of Rome. And that's been a fun project to, to be involved with. Um, and they're, they're having to optimize it to make it something you can walk around in real time. And they're doing some work on making it rather more attractive and kind of um, complete looking at ground level for an immersive experience. They never really built it for that, but... It turns out that it can be used for that, and that's a really interesting project to see. So I'm looking forward to seeing that come out. Um, so they're, are... they're adding the dirt and grime then? Yeah, yeah. And dirt and grime is an interesting question because I haven't put it in, partly out of a sort of purism and partly because I just haven't had the time or know-how or resource to do it. And you know, any layer or, or detail you add to a model adds kind of an expense in modeling time and in processing time. But yes, they are making it look grimy and dirty and kind of convincing to the eye and they're putting in characters and set dressing and proper vegetation that animates and you know, rippling water and all the rest of it so it does look rather beautiful and it's uh, it's rather rather a thrill actually to see that develop well to turn to more academic pursuits you're also going to be offering a online course involving this uh, this model that you built can you tell us a little bit about that yeah, this is something we're really pleased with here. Uh, so Reading, like many universities, offers these massive open online courses, or MOOCs, to use the acronym. And we offer our MOOCs through the, the FutureLearn platform, uh, which is a consortium of British and international universities. And Reading has 15 of these courses so far. Uh, my Rome course is number 15. And we ran it for the first time in March, and we'll run it again in the autumn. We had about 13,000 people take it. And it's five weeks of... Um, instruction in the city there are little videos that we filmed in Rome of me talking about the buildings there are articles and quizzes and things and there are also bits of the digital model that learners can download and walk around or navigate around for themselves and then discuss so we've built up quite a lot of user feedback on people's experience of using this kind of 3d technology to investigate an ancient city Um, and I'm now wading through that that feedback and and uh trying to pick out themes from it we had about thirty thousand comments left on the course when we ran it for the first time so, <laughs> so i mean who, who are you feedback. yeah who are you who are you aiming the course at then i mean who is the intended audience i think probably the kind of people who turned up with such interesting questions in the ama that i did that was just really fun seeing the range of backgrounds and interests and the levels of prior knowledge very wide from all sorts of people all over the world it's just a period in a place that interests a lot of people so the, the kinds of people that I've seen on the course have been 
mostly, as it were, interested lay people who uh, have been to Rome on holiday or are contemplating a trip to Rome or went once and you know, want to refresh their memories, people studying it at school or school teachers, um, people with you know, particular sorts of interest in the social history or the buildings or a more general interest in just the past. And you know, this week they like looking at ancient Rome and next week they might go and do a course on the Egyptians. I mean, a really great mix of people and such lively and well-informed comments on the discussion boards for this course. It was a real joy. So I think it's the same kind of, you know, putting it out there for a general public that was uh, behind the AMA that we did. And have you received particular feedback, which is, I mean, uh, perhaps help model the course or perhaps even help change the model a bit? Yeah. And as I say, we're we're going through this now because I want to try and get a a statistical understanding of, of particular themes and topics that come up because there are just so many comments. I can't physically read all of them or respond to them all. But anecdotally, from going in there every day and looking at the kind of chatter that we had, I think people really liked the 3D model, which is very gratifying. And then where we were inviting feedback or critique or wouldn't it be nice if kind of comments, we got some really interesting discussions. So a lot of people said, what about grime and dirt and, and where are the people, which are all fair comments and I have answers to them. But the kind of level of appetite for those features was striking and it might be something we try and work with in the future, maybe making a little bit of the city that offers that perspective or that kind of, as it were, set dressing to show people visually at least an indication of, of different styles of, of the modelling. Uh, a lot of people um, found it useful to be able to walk through the spaces but wanted more mapping aids or more you are here kind of navigational aids. So that's something that we're going to look at within the limits of the technology that we have. Uh, we're going to try and, and offer that a bit. Um, very interesting to see what people took away. A lot of people making comparisons between modern cityscapes and ancient cityscapes that I found interesting. Um, lots of people saying that they like the contrast between big monuments and the more ordinary residential streets, which was which was nice because that was kind of a theme of the course, or one of the themes of the course. So some really useful feedback, and it will change the way we offer the course and the way I think about the model. And hopefully will be of interest to other people in this same sector, you know, people in museums or the heritage industry who are creating reconstructions, for example, for displays on sites, might find that quantity of feedback that we've amassed useful and helpful. So I ought to write this up into an article somewhere at some point. And have, have there been people who have been particularly surprised by some aspect of, of ancient Rome uh, through the model? I think a lot of people... Um, they, they kind of expect grandeur. You know, that, that is the, you think of ancient Rome, you think of grand marble monuments. But I think a lot of people have been struck when they get into a bit more detail about how clever this stuff is and how capable the Romans were as architects and engineers and indeed as city founders and planners, you know, the, the aqueducts and the sewerage systems. I tried to do the nitty gritty infrastructure stuff as well as the big monuments. So I saved the Colosseum almost to the end of the course in the first week because things like sewers and road systems. And I think people were really struck by how big Rome was, a million people or so, how clever some of the infrastructure and engineering was, how elegant some of the buildings are. And the sorts of needs that people have are, I mean, we need to be careful about making the Romans exactly like us, but there are certain common themes or you know, elements of, of urban living, I guess, are just human constants. So the need for entertainment, the need for spaces for washing, for feeding, for shelter, uh, religious buildings, buildings for political activities of various sorts. So people could see inviting parallels between wherever they happen to live, and we have people from 190 countries taking these online courses, and and the ancient past. So lots of interesting sort of cross-cultural discussion going on. So to kind of bring us to a conclusion here, if someone wanted to take part in the next round of this of this MOOC, uh, how would they do so? I'd be delighted to see them there. So they would type into their favorite search engine, future learn, all one word, future learn and then new word Rome and that should bring them um, probably first hit to the uh, the registration page for this course which is on the future learn platform and is, is running again in late September October so they can sign up to register interest and then when the course starts they'll be invited by email to come along and participate um, it's five weeks but you don't have to do a set hours there's no particular commitment of time you're making you can drop in and out and browse it lots of people do that so it's, it's there for people to make as much of as they wish to. And it would be lovely to see some of the listeners there. Dr. Nichols, I want to thank you so much for volunteering some of your time to speak to us here on the Ask Historians podcast. My pleasure. Thank you for involving me. It's been lovely to talk to you and to uh, engage with some of the readers on Reddit.
And as always, a big thanks to all the listeners and, of course, a big thanks to our supporters on Patreon as well. And why not a, a big thanks to Professor Nichols once again for coming on the show and also doing uh, the previous AMA that he did with us, uh, which I will link to in the show notes um, in the discussion post, and as well as linking to how you can actually go if you want to go uh, sign up for that uh, online course that he that we were talking about there. Uh, so I hope you're really interested in it because I, I know I'm... I know that part of my fascination with history has always come from looking at maps. And I would say that now, of course, in a more highfalutin terms, I would say that, you know, because it was a representation of abstract data in a physical sense, but, you know, mostly because they're very interesting. You know, they, they maps tell a story. And when you do something like mapping an entire city so you can walk around it, it I mean, it's, it's a very kind of in-depth, very kind of, as I was saying, very intimate story. And I really love the point uh, where Professor Nichols said, you know, he made the map. And yet sometimes you get lost in the map itself. Uh, and it's kind of coming to realize just how big that city was, uh, Rome at a tight. So I hope you will, of course, uh, go check out that uh, course that he's offering there. And I hope you enjoyed the episode. And so uh, this comes as, as a little bit of a sad note for me to say that this will, in fact, be my last episode as host on the Ask Historians podcast. I'm stepping down to let uh, Brian and Andres take over as, as the full-time hosts. I've been doing this show for... Wow, how long have we been doing this show for? Three years, I think. I've been uh, the main host of the show, um, you know, putting out uh, an episode every fortnight. And as much as I love and as much as I've learned from this, I'm going to step down so I can <laughs> focus on the things in real life that are dragging me away and maybe spend some time working on my own projects. So I want to thank everybody who has listened to the show over the years that I've been doing it. I want to thank, uh, give a shout out to Taz, who originally started the show. Uh, and I want to thank uh, the people who gave so much feedback, both uh, supportive, um, informative, and even those of you who are kind of a prick about it. So I, I learned from all of you and have tried to tailor the show into something that is, is at least, I wouldn't say professional, but at least has improved and sounds good and provides excellent and meaningful and insightful content um, every two weeks to you. So um, once again, big thanks. I'm 100% confident in letting you in the most amazing hands you could possibly be in uh, with Brian and Andres. So, because they've been doing some amazing things with the show and kind of pushing it forward in directions that I just wasn't finding time uh, to contribute to the, the, the show. So, again, one last time, thank you all for listening. Thank you all for supporting the show. Thank you all for all your wonderful and kind words over the years. You've been listening to the Ask Historians podcast. For more history like this, visit us at reddit.com slash r slash askhistorians and ask over a hundred historians and enthusiasts anything you want to know in history. Find us on Twitter as at askhistorians and subscribe to the show on iTunes. Or visit askhistorians.libsyn.com Thank you very much for listening and join us next time on the Ask Historians podcast.